few queens have reigned over England in its long and often turbulent history. But one queen would become renowned for her religious zealous and hatred of Protestants. This is the history of Bloody Mary, Mary Tudor. Mary was born on the 18th of February 1516 at the Palace of Place and Tear in Greenwich, England. She was the only child of King Henry VIII and his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, to survive infancy. She was baptised into the Catholic faith at the Church of Observant Friars in Greenwich, three days after her birth. Henry VIII's first cousin once removed, Margaret Pole, Countess of Salisbury, stood sponsor for Mary's confirmation, which was conducted immediately after the baptism. The following year, Mary became a godmother herself when she was named as one of the sponsors of her cousin, Francis Brandon. Mary is believed to have been a precocious child. In July 1520, when scarcely four and a half years old, she entertained a visiting French delegation. A great part of her early education came from her mother, who consulted the Spanish humanist, Juan Luis Vives. By the age of nine, Mary could read and write Latin. She studied French, Spanish, music and dancing. Henry VIII doted on his daughter and boasted to the Venetian ambassador that Mary never cried. Mary had a fair complexion with pale blue eyes and a red ruddish gold hair. She was ruddy cheeked, a trait that she inherited from her father. Despite his affection for Mary, Henry was deeply disappointed that his marriage had produced no sons. By the time Mary was nine years old, it was apparent that Henry and Catherine would have no more children, leaving Henry without a legitimate male heir. In 1525, Henry sent Mary to the border of Wales to preside, presumably name only, over the Council of Wales and the Marshes. She was given her own court based at Ludlow Castle and many of the royal prerogatives normally reserved for a Prince of Wales. Some called her the Princess of Wales, although she was never technically invested with the title. Throughout Mary's childhood, Henry negotiated potential future marriages for her. When she was only two years old, Mary was promised to Francis, Dauphin of France, the infant son of King Francis I, but the contract was repudiated after three years. In 1522, at the age of six, she was instead contracted to marry her 22-year-old cousin, Charles V, Holy Roman Emperor. However, Charles broke off the engagement within a few years with Henry's agreement. Cardinal Wolsey, Henry's chief advisor, then resumed marriage negotiations with the French, and Henry suggested that Mary marry the French king Francis I, who was eager for an alliance with England. A marriage treaty was signed, which provided that Mary marry either Francis I or his second son, Henry Duke of Orleans, but Wolsey secured an alliance with the French without the marriage. Although these various possibilities for Mary's marriage had been considered, the marriage of Mary's parents was itself in jeopardy, which threatened her status. Disappointed at the lack of a male heir and eager to remarry, Henry attempted to have his marriage to Catherine annulled, but Pope Clement VII refused his request. Henry claimed, citing biblical passages, Leviticus 20:21, 20, that the marriage was unclean because Catherine was the widow of his brother, Arthur, Prince of Wales, Mary's uncle. Catherine claimed that her marriage to Arthur was never consummated and so was not a valid marriage. From 1531, Mary was often sick with irregular periods and depression, although it is not clear whether this was caused by stress, puberty or a more deep-seated disease. She was not permitted to see her mother, whom Henry had sent to live away from court. In early 1533, Henry married Anne Boleyn, and in May, Thomas Cramber, the Archbishop of Canterbury, formally declared the marriage with Catherine void, and the marriage to Anne valid. Mary was deemed illegitimate. She was styled the Lady Mary rather than Princess, and her place in the line of succession was transferred to Henry and Anne's newborn daughter, Elizabeth. 
Mary determinedly refused to acknowledge that Anne was the Queen, or that Elizabeth was a princess, further enraging King Henry. Under strain, and with her movements restricted, Mary was frequently ill, which the royal physician attributed to her ill-treatment. Imperial Ambassador Eustace Chapuis became her close advisor and interceded unsuccessfully on her behalf at court. The relationship between Mary and her father worsened and they did not speak to each other for three years. Although both she and her mother were ill, Mary was refused permission to visit Catherine and when Catherine died in 1536, Mary was heartbroken. In 1536, Queen Anne fell from the King's favour and was beheaded. Elizabeth, like Mary, was declared illegitimate and stripped of her succession rights. Within two weeks of Anne's execution, Henry married Jane Seymour, who urged her husband to make peace with Mary. Henry insisted that Mary recognise him as the head of the Church of England, repudiate papal authority, acknowledge that the marriage between her parents was unlawful, and accept her own illegitimacy. She attempted to reconcile with Henry by submitting to his authority as far as God and conscience permitted but was eventually bullied into signing a document agreeing to all of Henry's demands. Reconciled with her father, Mary resumed her place at court. In 1542, following the execution of Henry's fifth wife, Catherine Howard, the unmarried Henry invited Mary to attend the royal Christmas festivities. At court, while her father was between marriages and thus without a consort, Mary acted as hostess. In 1543, Henry married his sixth and last wife, Catherine Parr, who was able to bring the family closer together. Henry returned Mary and Elizabeth to the line of succession through the Acts of Succession 1544, placing them after Edward, but both remained legally illegitimate. Henry VIII died in 1547 and Edward succeeded him. Mary inherited estates in Norfolk, Suffolk and Essex. For most of Edward's reign, Mary remained on her own estates and rarely attended court. Religious differences between Mary and Edward continued. Mary attended a reunion with Edward and Elizabeth for Christmas 1550, where the 13-year-old Edward embarrassed Mary, then 34, and reduced both her and himself to tears in front of the court by publicly reproving her for ignoring his laws regarding worship. Mary repeatedly refused Edward's demands that she abandon Catholicism. On 6th of July 1553, at the age of 15, Edward VI died of a lung infection, possibly tuberculosis. He did not want the crown to go to Mary because he feared she would restore Catholicism and undo his and their father's reforms, and so he planned to exclude her from the line of succession. Guided by John Dudley, the first Duke of Northumberland, and perhaps others, Edward excluded both of his sisters from the line of succession in his will. Edward then named Northumberland's daughter-in-law, Lady Jane Grey, the granddaughter of Henry VIII's younger sister, Mary, as his successor. On the 10th of July 1553, Lady Jane was proclaimed Queen by Northumberland and his supporters. On the same day, Mary's letter to the council arrived in London. By 12th of July, Mary and her supporters had assembled a military force at Framlingham Castle, Suffolk. Northumberland's support collapsed and Jane was deposed on the 19th of July. She and Northumberland were imprisoned in the Tower of London. Mary rode triumphantly into London on the 3rd of August 1553 on a wave of popular support. She was accompanied by her half-sister Elizabeth and a procession of over 800 nobles and gentlemen. On the 1st of October 1553, Mary was formally crowned at Westminster Abbey. In the month following her ascension, Mary issued a proclamation that she would not compel any of her subjects to follow her religion. But by the end of September 1553, leading Protestant churchmen, including Thomas Cramber, John Bradford, John Rogers and John Hooper and Hugh Latimer 
were imprisoned. Now aged 37, Mary turned her attention to finding a husband and producing an heir, which would prevent the Protestant Elizabeth, who was still next in line under the terms of Henry VIII's will, from succeeding to the throne. Edward Courtney and Reginald Pole were both mentioned as prospective suitors, but her cousin Charles V suggested she marry his only legitimate son, Prince Philip of Spain. Her advisor in the English House of Commons unsuccessfully petitioned Mary to consider marrying an Englishman, but she insisted on Philip. Their wedding at Winchester Cathedral on the 25th of July 1554 took place just two days after their first meeting. Philip could not speak English and so they spoke a mixture of Spanish, French and Latin. In September 1554, Mary stopped menstruating. She gained weight and felt nauseated in the mornings. For these reasons, almost the entirety of her court, including her physicians, believed that she was pregnant. Parliament passed an act making Philip regent in the event of Mary's death in childbirth. In the last weeks of April 1555, Elizabeth was released from house arrest and called to court to witness the birth, which was expected imminently. Thanksgiving services in the Diocese of London were held at the end of April after false rumours that Mary had given birth to a son spread across Europe. Through May and June, the apparent delay in delivery fed gossip that Mary was not pregnant. Mary continued to exhibit signs of pregnancy until 1555, when her abdomen receded. It was most likely a false pregnancy, perhaps induced by Mary's overwhelming desire to have a child. In August, soon after the disgrace of the false pregnancy, which Mary considered God's punishment for having tolerated heretics in her realm, Philip left England to command his armies against France in Flanders. Mary was heartbroken and fell into a deep depression. Mary rejected the break with Rome her father instituted and the establishment of Protestantism by her brother's regents. Philip persuaded Parliament to repeal Henry's religious laws, returning the English church to Roman jurisdiction. Reaching an agreement took many months and Mary and Pope Julius III had to make major concessions. The confiscated monastery lands were not returned to the church but remained in the hands of their influential new owners. Around 800 rich Protestants, including John Fox, fled into exile. Those who stayed and persisted in publicly proclaiming their beliefs became targets of heresy laws. The first executions occurred over five days in February 1555. John Rogers on the 4th of February, Lawrence Saunders on the 8th of February, and Roland Tyler and John Hooper on the 9th of February. Thomas Cramber, the imprisoned Archbishop of Canterbury was forced to watch Bishops Ridley and Latimer being burned at the stake. In total, 283 were executed, most by burning. The burnings proved so unpopular that even Alfonso de Castro, one of Philip's own ecclesiastical staff, condemned them, and another advisor, Simon Reynard, warned him that such cruel enforcement could cause a revolt. Mary persevered with the policy, which continued until her death, and exacerbated anti-Catholic and anti-Spanish feeling among the English people. After Philip's visit in 1557, Mary again thought she was pregnant, with a baby due in March 1558. She decreed in her will that her husband would be the regent during the minority of their child, but no child was born, and Mary was forced to accept that her half-sister Elizabeth would be her lawful successor. From May 1558, Mary became weak and ill, in pain possibly from ovarian cysts or cancer. She died on the 17th of November, aged 42, at St James's Palace. Although Mary's will stated that she wished to be buried next to her mother, she was interred in Westminster Abbey on the 14th of December, in a tomb she eventually shared with Elizabeth. The inscription on their tomb, affixed there by James I when he succeeded Elizabeth, reads, Consorts in realm and tomb, 
we sisters Elizabeth and Mary here lie down to sleep in hope of the resurrection. <laughs>